I woke up this morning to the wonderful news that the case against Parker's for the boat crash that killed Mallory Beach has been settled for a reported $15 million, $10 million less than a previous settlement offer that was rejected by Parker. The trial that was due to begin August 14th is now canceled. Congratulations, Renee Beach, Mark Tinsley, and Tabor Vox. This comes after three motions were filed in the last few weeks. A motion to disqualify Mark Tinsley that was denied June 30th, a motion to transfer venue, and a motion to sever, both filed July 7th and both denied last Friday the 14th. I'm still posting the video because it explains those motions and what led to Parker choosing to settle rather than fight this case in court. So here goes. In addition to my continuing series Murdoch Money the Victims and Murdoch's Rise and Fall, I'll be starting a new series on the boat crash that caused the death of Mallory Beach and was the beginning of the end for Alex Murdoch. That trial is scheduled to begin August 14th, so there are a few updates about motions recently filed that I would like to share with you today. This is Cassidy O'Connell. Welcome to the preview of Not in Vain. I think most of you know that Mallory Beach's mother, Renee Beach, hired Mark Tinsley to represent her in this case. It has changed a lot since it was initially filed, and I do plan to cover that whole process. But today, I'm going to focus on just a few updates. As I mentioned, the trial is set for August 14th, so naturally, a lot of motions are being put forth to the courts to try to get the most wins they can pre-trial. These have mostly been filed by Greg Parker of Parker's, the gas station where Paul and Miley purchased the alcohol they consumed the night of the crash. Let's get started. The first one I want to cover is their motion to disqualify Mark Tinsley. This was filed on June 13th, 2023. It's a thick file, 27 pages long, and it makes three main accusations. One, that he improperly received Parker's privileged documents. Two, he improperly disclosed privileged information and materials. And three, his improper communications with a represented person in a related lawsuit. They include co-counsel Vox in the first accusation. Before doing this research, I could kind of see both sides with the Parker's position in this lawsuit. On one hand, they did sell alcohol to minors. Now in the case of Miley, who bought beer and White Claws from Parker's too, she had a fake ID that scans correctly. It has her photo and is easily taken as a legitimate ID. Paul using Buster's ID, however, in my opinion, is inexcusable. They do not look alike. They are completely different heights and weights, and Paul looked even younger than his age. This was, in my opinion, definitely negligence, and if not done intentionally, then at a minimum, done carelessly. At the same time, I did feel bad for the owner that their employee didn't follow through with proper ID checking. And yet, Greg Parker has made some remarks that haven't won him much sympathy with the public. You can also see that they're a main target of the suit because they are, quite frankly, the best means of collecting financial wins, since Luther's Rare and Well Done was removed as defendants in June 2019. I'm told it was after they settled, though all information of that is sealed and undisclosed. If you don't remember, Luther's is the bar that served an already obviously drunk Paul and Connor with Connor's fake ID and Paul using Buster's ID again. In my opinion, Luther's holds more culpability since it was around 1 a.m. and two staggeringly drunk kids walk in and proceed to be served two rounds of shots in a very short amount of time, where Paul pretty obviously is using someone else's ID. Luther's is a smaller bar, while Parker's is a chain and has deeper pockets. Much as I like Attorney Tinsley and am totally on the side of Mallory's family, it felt a little unfair that Parker's was taking all the brunt of this. Yet, on the other hand, establishments like this have to pay better attention to who they're selling alcohol to. And without cases like this, it's unlikely that these habits will change. Who knows how many have been injured or killed by this sort of negligence, or how many lives may be saved with stricter adherence to the laws on liquor sales to minors. Also of note, every other defendant has settled or been dismissed, including most recently, Paul's estate. Parker's has refused to settle at least once on the record, according to the Wall Street Journal. That's something I will look into more in the actual boat case series, 
So the fact that they have rejected offers to settle did irk me a little bit when I saw this snippet from Court TV. The claim against Parker is just pretty simple. It's plain and simple. It's whether or not the, the transaction that happened at Parker's, um, which we believe followed the law, uh, that she checked the ID of, Par of, of Paul, uh, thinking that it was um, Buster. She looked at it, she scanned it, and she made a valid legal transaction. We're not here to talk about all the facts of the case, but that's really it. They're alleging that that was not done appropriately. Also, as I said, I felt a certain way before I did my research. After everything I read, I have zero sympathy for these people, for their actions since the boat crash. My opinion of Greg Parker is now nearing my opinion of Alex, a wealthy man whose money means more to him than human life, even young human life. You'll see what I mean as this unfolds. But back to the point of money. Alex's funds are severely tied up already. He's having trouble even to pay his lawyers. He's also being sued on a federal and a state level for his stealing money from his clients. He was either so bad with all the millions he both earned and stole that it's either truly gone or he's found a way to stash it that no one has been able to trace so far. Either way, fair or not, the only chance at a big financial win is basically down to Parker's. So Parker's attempted to be dismissed from this lawsuit, and that was denied, and this happened way back. We'll get into the previous filings in the Boat Case series, but that one's important because it was the beginning. Then they moved on to other motions and methods. These newest filings that we're gonna to consider today are the one that I've already mentioned about disqualifying Tinsley, and also a motion to transfer venue and a motion to sever from Alex. These last two were both drawn up July 7th and have both been before courts before, and we'll get into all that. But let's start with this motion to disqualify, since it's the oldest of the three, having been filed on June 13th. The accusations start strong in the second paragraph, and I'll read directly from that. It says, Tinsley has turned this lawsuit into a multi-front war against Parkers. A little dramatic. And then it goes on. His campaign includes a parallel lawsuit about the alleged disclosure of materials related to this lawsuit. There, Tinsley issued subpoenas plainly intended to obtain confidential and privileged information about Parker's strategy in this lawsuit, using an action in one theater of the conflict to benefit another. So they bring up this other lawsuit and they say that Tinsley filed that one in order to get information from it to be used in this one. We're gonna go through those documents and I'll let you decide for yourself if you find this statement to be true or not. This accusation that he issued subpoenas plainly intended to obtain confidential and privileged information is regarding a secondary case known as the Civil Conspiracy Outrage Case. And this was filed back on December 3rd, 2021. It's centered around a mediation video. The plaintiffs in that case are Mallory's mom, Renee Beach, her father, Philip Beach, Philip's wife, Robin Beach, and also named as Mallory's sister, Savannah, with her married name, Tootin, and her husband, Seth Tootin. The summons states in point one, as part of her efforts in the civil action, and I should be clear, this was filed by Mark Tinsley. As part of her efforts in the civil action and in accordance with the confidential mediation process required by the South Carolina Alternative Dispute Resolution Rules, Renee Beach produced a confidential mediation presentation video. This confidential video remains the private property of Renee Beach. So Mallory's mom produced a video that was strictly to present for mediation. She was required by the South Carolina Alternative Dispute Resolution Rules to make this. As such, it is considered confidential and privileged. It's her personal property. Imagine having to create and present a video about the death of your young daughter. Point six of this document goes on, plaintiff's counsel emailed Parker's counsel of record in the civil action the confidential mediation video as part of the confidential mediation process in the civil action. So her video is shared with defendant's counsel as expected, but it's also shared with Greg Parker as shown here. Further down in the document it reads, Parker's counsel of record in the civil action shared the confidential mediation video with defendants Parker, Greco, and DeCruz. 
Now it's one thing for Parker to have knowledge of this video. It's a completely different story for him to have an actual file of it. And we'll see why. So here are the people so far, at that point that this was written, who had access to the video. Gregory Parker, who is the owner of Parker's, and one of the last remaining defendants in that suit. Blake Greco, who is the general counsel at the Parker Companies. And Jason DeCruz, who is the personal legal counsel to Greg Parker. Back to the document, point eight goes on. Jason DeCruz acts as personal legal counsel of defendant Gregory Parker and advises or directs activities of Parker's in its handling of the civil action. DeCruz has attended and participated in proceedings in the civil action. DeCruz owed an independent duty to plaintiffs to maintain the confidentiality of the mediation video. Jason is his personal legal counsel, attending and participating in the proceedings, so he's well aware of and understands privilege. Yet, he's described as, in point eight, all times herein acted in his own personal interest, outside the scope of his representation of defendant Gregory Parker and or Parker's. So what does this mean? A leak is discovered and a big battle to find where the leak came from ensues. Mark Tinsley throws the first punch in the form of this suit, claiming that the leak had to have come from the Parker's side. So who are the defendants in this suit? Besides the attorneys just listed, it's also Max Fertotti. He's a private investigator for Private Investigation Services Group. In a posted review from his website, he's described as a retired FBI agent, highly skilled in experience to include international security experience. The second name listed, Henry Rosado, is described in his own LinkedIn as the owner and founder of Private Investigation Services. Now going back to point 10 of the document, Henry Rosado and Private Investigation Services Group worked with Parker, Greco, and DeCruz in furtherance of a plan to launch and present a social media campaign to inflict severe emotional distress upon the plaintiffs to diminish their resolve to prosecute Parker's for contributing to causing the death of Mallory Beach in the civil action and arranged for or participated in the distribution of the confidential mediation and other private materials to Vicki Ward and others. That brings another name in the suit, Vicki Ward. Who is Vicki Ward? Her website says, Vicki Ward is a New York Times bestselling author, podcaster, documentary host, and producer, former CNN senior reporter, magazine editor at large, and entrepreneur. She became better known for her coverage of the Jeffrey Epstein case, but she is not without criticism for her work covering it. Some of his victims are very upset and even claim to have filed cease and desist orders on her. But if I go down that rabbit hole right now, we're never gonna finish this. You can find those articles in The New Yorker and page six. But why is Vicki Ward important to this case? Because the complaint goes on to make the following allegation. In point 12, it reads, Defendants Gregory M. Parker, Blake Greco, Jason DeCruz, and Parkers, through what amounts to an abusive process and fraudulent means with the intent and ulterior motive to harm the family, were able to obtain photographs of Mallory Beach's dead body. Providing more details, point 13 goes on to add, defendants Parker, Greco, and DeCruz hired social media knife fighters and others to affect the proceedings in the civil action and to devise a way to harm the plaintiffs to affect their resolve in prosecuting civil action. They created fake social media posts in order to harass and emotionally harm the plaintiffs. These defendants conspired with defendants for Toti, Rosado, and Private Investigation Services Group, who worked with Parker, Greco, and DeCruz in furtherance of the plan to launch and present a social media campaign and to misappropriate the private property of the plaintiffs, invade their privacy, and misappropriate their images, all in an effort to inflict severe emotional distress upon the plaintiffs to diminish their resolve to prosecute Parkers for contributing to causing the death of Mallory Beach in the civil action. So are you still wondering how this pertains to Vicki Ward? Reading on, the defendants singularly or in concert arranged for and provided Ward with photographs of Mallory Beach's dead body. Now, why did Vicki Ward want such morbid photos? 
Vicki Ward was helping produce an investigative discovery documentary entitled The Murdoch Murders, and the creators wanted the shock value of these never-released photos of a beautiful young girl's dead body to hype up the trailer for her documentary. From what I understand, these photos of deceased Mallory's face were barely blurred so that a lot could still be seen in this trailer. Can we pause for a moment and let it sink in how disgusting this is? Now let's back up to point nine. I had skipped it earlier. It says defendant Vicki Ward produced and released or plans to produce and release what she claims to be a documentary entitled The Murdoch Murders. On or prior to November 24th, 2021, defendant Ward and those with whom she is acting in concert published publicly a video trailer for her documentary entitled The Murdoch Murders. The trailer video incorporates six different sections from the confidential mediation video belonging to the Beach family. So this trailer leaked for a short time to the public with the barely blurred photos and privileged information. In the process of pursuing this civil conspiracy suit, Tinsley subpoenas a list of people. These are the subpoenas that they're trying to use against Tinsley, saying that he used these in order to get information for the other suit. But actually, he was trying to run down this leak for the sake of Mallory's family to stop these disgusting leaked photos from coming out. So after Tinsley serves these subpoenas, defense files a motion to quash them. During the hearing on the motion to quash, and quash, by the way, means to basically make the subpoenas invalid. In some cases, not entirely invalid, just restricted. But in this case, it was to make them invalid. But during this hearing, Tinsley relays the alleged conversations that he had with Vicki Ward. It says, in September, I believe, I got a call from a Dateline producer. This producer told me that a woman by the name of Vicki Ward, a reporter from New York, had purchased the beach file. I didn't know what she meant. It didn't make any sense to me. And so a couple of days later, I picked up the phone and I called Vicki Ward. I didn't get an answer. I hung up my cell phone and coincidentally, the receptionist tells me Vicki Ward is on the phone. And, and I said, I understand you bought the file because I'm thinking there are lots of documents filed in the Beach case. Why on earth would anybody buy these public documents? And she tells me that she got the documents from the law firm of Baker Hostetler, which is the law firm that Mr. DeCruz works for. Remember this photo from earlier? It goes on. Miss Ward told me, among other things, that Parker's had an agenda. I said, I have an agenda too. My agenda is to hold these people accountable. She said, well, they're dirty. They're slimy. I don't have anything to do with them other than I bought their documents. And I'm coming to South Carolina and I want you to sit for my sizzle reel, which apparently is a trailer that they put together to be able to sell a project like a documentary to, in this case, Discovery Channel. I said I would agree to meet with her. I met with her in Beaufort at Taylor Vox office shortly thereafter to find out what she had. What she had was, the first time I learned, she had a copy of my mediation video. She also had copies of the lawyer's notes from the depositions, which would include things like when the officer was being deposed, we would go off the record for the officer's phone number. She has those notes. I didn't take any of those notes. I don't have any of those notes. So, according to Tinsley, she's trying to press him into appearing on her documentary, and she even went on to claim that he supplied her with the confidential information. So now we have a he said, she said situation on our hands. Back to the document, point 14 goes on. On or about September 14th, 2021, Vicki Ward was told that the confidential video she had in her possession was in fact confidential and in her possession in violation of the confidential mediation process and its rules. In an attempt to get the plaintiffs and their counsel to appear in her documentary, Vicki Ward acknowledged that Parker and his law firm, referencing defendant DeCruz's law firm, Baker Hostetler, had an agenda that she had nothing to do with them other than having their stuff. The plaintiffs and their counsel refused to participate in Ward's documentary. Good for them. Now, defense claims in this motion to disqualify Tinsley that Miss Ward adamantly disputes Mr. Tinsley's version of the facts and denies that she received the mediation video or any other information from Parker's defendants. But a quick look at the text messages between Tinsley and Vicki Ward on September 11th, 2021, for the first time, shows that Vicki already has the confidential material in her possession and even tells Tinsley she cannot disclose where it came from. 
Let's read through these real quick. She begins the conversation. Hi, Mark. It's Vicki Ward. So when could I come meet with you? As of now, I'm pretty open starting Tuesday morning. Let me know. Look forward. Best. Vicki. So he responds. Tuesday likely works best for me. Not sure what time yet. I'll likely be in Bluffton. She responds, great, keep me posted. And a little later, hi Mark, any thoughts on timing for tomorrow? Best. Vicky. He responds, what works for you? Morning works better for me. She says, okay, I'm staying in Hilton Head, so that works. What time? He says, I'll find out shortly. A little bit later, how about 10 a.m. in Bluffton? And she responds, perfect. Where am I coming? He says, I'll figure it out, and then a little bit later, gives her the address. Then comes a little weird one that later Tinsley describes as thinking that he assumes she meant this for someone else, so he doesn't bother to respond. But it says, room 455, all clothes okay. So later on, she texts him again. Is the guy they arrested the guy who phoned you? Mark Tinsley responds, no, the guy arrested is who I was phoned about. She answers, got it, amazing. Then she sends him a clip and says, did you see the New York Times? What do you make of that? And he doesn't respond right away. She texts again, hi Mark, wondering if we can chat regarding getting a snippet of you for our sizzle tomorrow. I know you're in depositions today. I hear you're a big hunter, and I was wondering if there was somewhere to film you that illustrates that. You will probably say I'm overreaching. He responds, hey, so where are we on the Parker's affidavit or filming? She replies, I wanted to film you tomorrow. Now here, this, this part's really important. As you probably guessed, I can't get into where our source material comes from. So obviously, if Mark was the one who supplied her with this confidential information, why would she say this to him? Back to the messages. But think that the reporting I'm doing ought to be helpful to you and your clients. So hope you would consider helping me with that by letting me interview you. Your call, obviously, best fee. Then he responds, where do you want to meet? She says, oh wow, we're headed to the airport. Let me talk to the crew. Where are you? He answers, which airport? What time? She asks him, could you zoom at 5 p.m. today? And he says, no. Can you stop by Tabor's office? It's on the way. And she says, we would have to take a later flight, seeing what we can do. So in my opinion, it's pretty clear who's right in the he said, she said. But there's more on that later. So here's where we are now with this allegation. Renee followed directions and prepared a video. It's shared with plaintiff's attorneys, which is fine. They're under rules of privilege and have access to all the discovery anyway. But then... It's shared with Gregory Parker, who Tinsley alleges concocted a plan to attack Mallory's family to discourage them from pursuing the suit. Greg Parker then passes the information on to his hired private investigators. And back when this is filed, Tinsley's assuming that the pictures and information from the six different sections that were mentioned of this mediation video that appears in the trailer were leaked directly to Vicki, as we see in this chart. So in this blame game, Parker's team subpoenas Tinsley's phone records, claiming that it was Tinsley who leaked the information. Tinsley files a motion to quash that subpoena, and this motion is dated August 13, 2022. And in that motion, in the footnote, we find the following information. It says, because the Beach family copyrighted the mediation video and sent cease and desist letters to the companies responsible for the production and airing of the documentary, threatening the violation of the copyright would result in legal action. The Beach family was able to stop the mediation video from being aired. So thankfully, because of his quick action, airing of this was stopped. So I think it's pretty clear the point of him serving those subpoenas and tracking down this leak was for Mallory Beach's family's benefit, not for him to get information to be used in another suit. This is the documentary that's in question. Notice the name Greg Roman. This is an important name in this, but who is he? In addition to his role on this documentary, Roman published a blog post in 2021 which contained all sorts of inside information on the Murdoch family. So where is all of this leaked information coming from? The motion to quash subpoena that we just referred to helps piece it all together. I'm going to read directly from it. The Blackfin production had images from the confidential mediation video produced in the boat crash litigation. Photographs of Mallory's dead body that were collected by counsel for the Parker defendants. Exhibits from doctor's depositions taken in the boat crash litigation. 
never released Snapchat videos, and video surveillance of Paul drinking alcohol at a fraternity party in March of 2021. This is important. Taken by Greg Parker's private investigator. All these materials have been aired by Blackfin at some point. So this Greg Roman somehow has and airs all of these confidential and never released pieces of evidence, all of which end up being aired by Blackfin. And video surveillance of Paul is included. This surveillance is described as being taken by Greg Parker's private investigators. So exactly what were these private investigators hired to investigate? Back to the document. Sarah Capelli was hired by Greg Parker after the boat crash to obtain video surveillance of Paul Murdoch drinking alcohol, supposedly to show his propensity to drink. That video is part of the Blackfin production, The Murdoch Murders, Deadly Dynasties. And in the footnote, it says significantly, Paul was 21 years old when this occurred. So Greg Parker set out to produce a smear campaign using TV, blogs, reporting, streaming services, but he threw in these confidential items as well. And here's the bombshell going on with this document. At the time of the leak, only the Parker defendants and Capelli had access to that video. In fact, as this court is aware, the Knife Fighter documents show Capelli's video being sent by email on March 2nd, 2021 from a partner at the Lawrence Group, this Lawrence Group name is important, to only one person, Jason DeCruz, Greg Parker's personal counsel. So these videos taken by these private investigators are reporting directly back to Jason DeCruz with their surveillance video, emailing them to him. So let's update our chart. We can now rule out Blake Greco and confirm Jason DeCruz as in the line of this leak. The document goes on. As the recent Wall Street Journal article confirms, Greg Parker and his team admitted on the record that Greg Roman, who they referred to as an investigative journalist, was hired and paid by Greg Parker to write an article entitled Death and Justice, The Murdoch Family Murders that was published on July 27, 2021 on Greg Roman's website and to create this Blackfin documentary. Vicki Ward, of course, is Greg Roman's partner in crime and his executive co-producer for the documentary, as confirmed in the image below that appeared at the end of the documentary. And here is the image. We see the, both of their names listed as executive producers, Vicki Ward and Greg Roman. So this back and forth blaming finally comes to an end as Vicki Ward signs an affidavit admitting how she obtained the confidential files. This is point five of her affidavit, and it says, This video was shared with me by Greg Roman, an executive producer of this documentary. It was provided to me on September 9th, 2021, by means of a text message through the Signal Messaging application that included a clickable hyperlink. Now, we've seen this name Sarah Capelli come up as a person hired to obtain video surveillance. We also keep reading about this knife fighter. So let's follow that path. The knife fighter turns out to be Wesley Donahue, a corporate communications consultant who created the Lawrence Group. Remember I told you the Lawrence Group was important. Another person hired by Parker who said to have prepared a research document entitled The Murdoch Report that was quoted from word for word. He continues to deny any hand in the distribution of the confidential files. And in an interview we can see on YouTube with Will Folks of Fitz News, he says that he had never even seen the leaked photos. Continuing through the list of people that Mark Tinsley served subpoenas to, he speaks to attorney Sandy Sin, who is the counsel for this Lawrence group. This is the one that's owned by this Wesley Donahue or this knife fighter. He also speaks to Sarah Capelli, the only registered agent of Inquiry Agency. So in the hearing, Tensley states, Miss Sin tells me the person I really want is the private investigator who is doing lots of this work because Mr. Parker wanted three things. He wanted video of Paul Murdoch drinking, partying, and talking about killing that girl, and I assume that's Mallory Beach. And he wanted to prove that Buster Murdoch is gay. And so they hired Sarah Capelli. So we served Sarah Capelli. Almost immediately, Sarah Capelli sends me a friend request on Facebook and calls me. 
and she has the most extreme case of diarrhea of the mouth of any person I've ever talked to. She begins to explain all the details of what Parker's was hired to do. I mean, what Parker's hired her to do. What they hired the two PIs, Max and Henry, to do. And that their intent was to paint a picture that because Buster Murdoch is gay, he must have been involved in the murder of Stephen Smith. A personal note, it's never been proven that Buster Murdoch is gay, and he himself has denied it back to the document. And because they had this narrative that they were pushing out that the Murdochs were terrible people, and they very well may be terrible people, but because they're terrible people, then a jury ought not find against him in the boat crash. This is what I'm told that Mr. Parker wanted the information related to Buster Murdoch for, as well as the information related to Paul's drinking, partying, and talking about killing that girl. So, Parker was out there hiring multiple private investigators and reporters and consultants, providing them with confidential and sensitive information to fight dirty in this lawsuit. Here is where I officially declare no amount of sympathy for this man and his millions of dollars. So let's update our chart. We know the initial file was only sent to and shared by Jason DeCruz. From there, it obviously went to his client, Greg Parker, who then allegedly shared it with private investigators and a consultant, as well as journalist and producer Greg Roman, who then shared it with fellow producer Vicki Ward. And it was obviously shared with production because it ended up being used in the trailer for the documentary. It's hard to tell how many people that was, from producers, writers, directors, to film editors, etc. And this was all discovered because of Tensley's subpoenas and his hard work tracking down all of his leads. Defense says Parker's was not properly notified of these subpoenas, and as soon as they heard of them, they moved to watch those subpoenas. And on the basis of that, the documents were privileged attorney-client communications and or work product. This move of theirs to Quash is denied in court on March 24, 2022 after which defense files a motion for reconsideration and a motion for stay, and a status conference is held telephonically on April 1st, and the order is then modified. Reading directly from the order, it says the court hereby modifies its order signed on March 24th, 2022. The court hereby orders that all discovery documents responsive to the two subpoenas be sent to the court for an in-camera review. So, all the discovery that comes from these subpoenas is supposed to be reviewed by the court. And, back to the order, the Parker's defendant's motions to reconsider and to stay are denied. It is so ordered. Next, defense files the first motion to sever, or to separate their portion of the trial from Alex Murdoch's, which is initially approved and ordered by the court. They also file a motion to transfer venue. On August 30th, 2022, Mark Tensley writes a memorandum in opposition of this decision, stating amongst other things. Further, the trial of any wrongful death claim, much less one in which the family will be forced to relive the week-long search for their daughter in the vast expanse of the Beaufort waterways and marshes, is a traumatic experience that no family should be forced to endure more than once. If separate trials are ordered, there will be no collateral estoppel effect from the first trial and no findings will be binding on the other defendants in a later trial. As such, there is no judicial economy promoted by separate trials. In essence, there will be nothing to avoid complete duplication in a second trial of the other defendants or to prevent the certainty of inconsistent verdicts. After consideration by Judge Hall, the order is reversed two weeks later. We initially, on behalf of Parker, sought severance uh, from this court uh, back in August of 2022, Your Honor, as you're well aware that uh, Your Honor granted that motion uh, and issued a very detailed order dated September 13, 2022. Uh, <clears throat> and then ultimately, um, Your Honor, after uh, granting the motion, reversed it two weeks later. Defense goes on to say Tinsley shouldn't have proceeded with the subpoenas filed in January and that he had inappropriate communication with these people that we've just read about. So now we go on with their next move. On September 27th, 2022, they filed the first version of this motion to disqualify Mark Tinsley. We've been considering the more recent one that was filed in June. In the original version, they point to a hearing held on March 16th, 2022, where he relays the conversations he had with Vicki Ward, Attorney Sen, and Capelli that we just read, and we read from that hearing. Note, 
he is not disqualified. That brings us to this second motion to disqualify that was filed on June 13th, 2023 that we've been considering today. This was also promptly denied on June 30th, 2023. On July 7th, 2023, Defense filed a second motion to transfer venue, as well as a second motion to sever. These were put before Judge Hall Friday, July 14th, 2023, just last week. Let's look at some highlights of that, courtesy of Court TV. First, attorney Pankaj Shear puts forth his arguments for why Parker should be severed from Alex Murdoch. A point that I found particularly troubling was his downplaying of Parker's role in the boat crash. In South Carolina, if Parker's is found 1% at fault, they're going to pay the entirety of the verdict for the sins of the Murdochs. He goes on to express how very unfair it all is because of all the awareness of the trial, and he moves on with the line that places the blame solely on the Murdochs and none on his client. Finally, he laments how well known the trial is, and with all the rage against Alex, it will bring an unfair prejudice on his client. Mr. Tinsley fought hard to tether us back to Alec Murdoch and the Murdochs for one reason, and that is to infuriate a jury, to get a jury mad at Alec Murdoch and everything that surrounds Alec, the murders, and everything else to get a jury infuriated with him and then have Parker's pay for it. Tinsley reminds the court that it was the actions of Greg Parker, as we've seen play out in today's episode, with the leaking of documents and hiring of private investigators, consultants, and reporters that helped blow up the media's interest in this case. He supplied leaked information for a documentary, and now they want to cry about it because it didn't go their way. The blog, the 28-page blog, that that Greg Parker's employee filed and, and made public in July of 2021 after the murders, containing inside information only available to the lawyers. Mr. Parker has sat with the Wall Street Journal. He sought the Wall Street Journal out to make this subject the, the focus of worldwide attention. He sat with Dateline. He sought them out. He sat with Netflix. He sought them out to give his statement. To the extent that they argue there's some change in circumstances and they, don't, they have unclean hands and all this attention, the facts don't support that, Your Honor. And there's no evidence in front of you that would support that conclusion. And that's the, really the point. Next, the court hears the reasons for the change of venue motion. Talking about Alec Murdoch and the Murdoch dynasty and the Murdoch family here in Hampton County. That's the reason, not because they can't be fair. It's because they're going, every juror brings their life experiences to the box. And that life experience here in Hampton County is going to be, to use Mr. Tinsley's term, it's gonna be infected with all, all of the media hurricane that is the Murdochs. And so, Your Honor, we would ask that there be a transfer venue. Then we hear Tinsley's response to it. The the, the rule, the law, uh, the Constitution require a formidable showing, a showing that it is truly impossible to strike a jury uh, in which the jurors, the venari, will either say that they will follow the law, say that they will abide by their oath, and follow Your Honor's instructions. Attorney Shear had spoken of two affidavits that he collected to prove that a fair trial in Hampton County would not be possible. Now, we see Tinsley in action and get a glimpse of why he's called the tiger. An affidavit, he says, in the fill-in-the-blank affidavit they got from, he, he said Mr. Rant, it's Gerald Brant, I, I know Mr. Brant, um, even if you were to consider this affidavit, and let, and let me jump back to Ms. Brown. Ms. Brown, in the fill in the blank affidavit, it says that she's a resident, because that's what Mr. Shearer wrote on it. But then she had the wherewithal on the last page to say, well, she lives in Florida. She's got some property here. It's not uncommon that people have hunting property here, and they're up here periodically. And, and she watched it on the TV, and, and she knows what she knows. There's no evidence there. Mr. Brandt's affidavit, uh, is equally 
uh, unable to establish any of the formidable uh, obstacles he has to establish. And if you look at the case of Stevens versus the Sun News, the Supreme Court talked about uh, what a formidable burden that is. And it was in the context, in that case, they actually used attorney affidavits. They used the senator's affidavit, uh, and it talked about the inability of the uh, Horry County to give a fair and impartial trial uh, to the plaintiff in that case. And the Supreme Court noted that, um, that those statements, the same statements that are outlined in Mr. Shear's fill-in-the-blank affidavit are mere conclusory statements. There is simply no showing. So I would submit to the court that he hasn't even met his initial burden of an affidavit that you can consider if you look at uh, the Stevens case. He then goes on to express more reasons to deny this motion. The idea that, th th that the wor there's worldwide attention, there's nationwide attention, there's statewide attention to this, where would we try it, Your Honor? Where would he go and find people who've not heard about it? Every case I've ever tried, the court says, do you know anything about this? Do you know anybody in this? And then ultimately, can you set that aside and listen to the evidence that comes from that chair right there and try this matter fairly and impartially. It may be come August the 15th, after we've been through all of the people who show up, that a change of venue mo would be appropriate at that time. If we are unable to select 20 people, which is what the Constitution requires, 20 people from which the strikes will be exercised, if we can't find 20 people in Hampton County, and I, <laughs> there's no question that we'll find 20 people. There's no question we'll find, I think we'll find more than 20 people in the first panel. But there's no evidence in front of this court that supports this baseless argument that they're making today, and we'd ask you to deny it. Next we hear from Alex's lawyer, Dawes Cook. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Cook, on behalf of Alec Murdoch, I'd be glad to hear from you. Thank you. Uh, on, on both motions, on the uh, motion to transfer venue, Your Honor, uh, just briefly, uh, his, his view is that there's really no place in the English-speaking world that you can transfer the case where people haven't heard about it. And uh, reluctantly have to agree with Mr. Tinsley that we're going to have to rely on the, the uh, integrity of the jury uh, and, and good voir dire and, and jury selection to find a panel that can put aside um, the, the, the other things surrounding the Murdochs and, and focus just on the facts of this case. So uh, for that reason, we have not joined in that motion to transfer venue. As to the motion to sever, Your Honor, um, the, one, the one, one interest we have is that we believe that under the Contribution Among Joint Tort Feasers Act, Mr. Murdoch is entitled to have his liability, if any, reduced by the uh, liability of others. Parkers can't because their liability arises out of the sale or use of alcohol, and that's one of the exclusions under the, under the act. But uh, we're going to take the position that that doesn't apply to Mr. Murdoch. And so it would complicate the trial if you had separate trials with Parkers and, um, and Mr. Murdoch. So for that reason, he opposes the motion to sever. All right. Thank you, Mr. Cook. And a short time later, we get Judge Hall's ruling. All right, I appreciate the arguments that have been made today, and I just want to remind everybody Judge Hall's had, uh, was appointed this case more than four years ago. I'm well aware of uh, the particular facts, the positions of the parties in the case, and I've had plenty of time uh, before today, in addition to the oral arguments, to review all the briefs, uh, the rulings I've made in the past, the arguments that were made on the briefs, the motions that had been filed in the case based upon that uh, on uh, Greg Parker's uh, second motion to sever. Uh, I deny that motion and Greg Parker's motion to transfer venue. Uh, the court denies that motion as well. We get a little bonus at the end brought up by Mark Tinsley. Yes, Your Honor. Yes, Mr. Uh, Tinsley. Mr. Cook uh, has just filed a motion for protective order related to Alex Merck's deposition, which is scheduled to take place on Tuesday. Um, I'd like to take that up. Uh, I have moral objections to the order, and I can explain that. Um, 
Mr. Murdoch. Yes. So Alex's deposition will be taken on Tuesday, it sounds like. I thought it had already been taken, but sounds like it's upcoming and hopefully we'll hear more about that soon. Another bit of breaking news is found here in Ann Emerson's tweet, where she says that Alex will be present for the boat case set to begin August 14th, 2023. And this is a question a lot of us had, whether or not he would be in attendance. So it looks like he will be there. In other news, Buster is said to be given an on-camera interview in an upcoming documentary titled The Fall of the House of Murdoch, due to air on Fox Nation September 12th. I'm still collecting information to do a more complete series on this boat crash, as well as finishing up Murdoch Money the Victims and the Murdoch's Rise and Fall, the history of the Murdoch family. Please bear with me as this research takes time. Thanks for watching, and as always, this is Cassidy O'Connell saying stay well and stay tuned.